Hello, and welcome back to Break the Twitch, the podcast about minimizing distractions and doing more of what matters through minimalism, habits, and creativity. I'm your host, Anthony Ungaro. And in this episode, I'm joined by Nick Knutson, who is an avid CrossFitter, a chef, and the founder of Wild Joy, where he is a personal mastery and vision coach for men. In this episode, we talk about everything from self-care to courage and CrossFit, and what it takes to challenge our natural tendencies to achieve meaningful personal growth. You're going to love this episode with Nick. This podcast is brought to you by the Break the Twitch member community, a group of now about 100 founding members that have joined to support the production of this podcast and the other work that we're doing here at Break the Twitch. Right now, there is a founding member deal that you can get in on that gives you access to all of the monthly audio courses, all the new things we're making every month behind the scenes, and more. If you're interested in supporting Break the Twitch, the work we're doing, and getting access to a ton of valuable, really cool stuff we're making, check out breakthetwitch.com slash community. But for now, let's start the show. Hey, Nick. Hi there. How's it going? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, you're you're very welcome. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to contribute. So I understand you just, uh, we just caught you after a trip to Iceland. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, my girlfriend and myself traveled uh, around the whole country of Iceland in a, in a a, a camper van uh, so it was a, a camper van that slept two people hmm. um, and we uh, picked that up in Reykjavik uh, the major city there and then we stopped at Costco and uh, took a huge hard nap right after because we flew in like international it wasn't too bad but took a huge hard nap in Costco uh, loaded up on on food and supplies and then off we went. We traveled around the whole uh, the whole island, and uh, what dictated our our trip most of the time was we wanted to seek out the best uh, thermal hot springs baths that uh, Iceland has to offer. So that was uh, one of the best parts of the trip was to seek out and find these little or big um, thermal hot springs baths in there. It's kind of like the um, sort of like our happy hour. Like it's what brings people together in the, in their communities. It's really unique, and um, I don't know. I really like that it is uh, deeply rooted in in tradition. What was that like? The the hot springs there. Was that your first time experiencing? So I think the the experience of like being in that kind of like the healing elements of like the minerality of the water. Uh, the 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 conversation around people uh, or with people and then just being like your body exposed to the outdoor elements in Iceland which aren't always like they're not uh, it's not California or Florida <laughs> right so uh, to have that um, I don't know to, to put yourself in a little bit of uncomfortable environments uh, in in the natural habitat is actually probably really healthy for us mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, generally speaking, we live very comfortable lives. And so to put yourself in um, more uncomfortable situations really does, uh, I think, pay dividends to our, our overall well-being. I definitely agree with that. And it also kind of calls back to how we met uh, at a sauna session at the Hewing Hotel in Minneapolis. Yes. Yep. And uh, that also is a place where you're definitely not as comfortable as you would be in a 72 degree perfectly air conditioned room or maybe as we're just used to being um and and that definitely is one of those things that broadens the mind maybe i think when you're in that level of discomfort and so many cool social connections come from that experience as well did you meet people in those like public baths and things you know actually where i had the 
uh, the most conversation with um, with like a local Icelander uh, was at a CrossFit gym. Oh, cool. <laughs> One of the beauties of, of being a, a sucker for CrossFit like me, uh, you can travel pretty much anywhere in the world and find a CrossFit gym. And you hope that there's like a good community that you find. And, and we were in the town of Akureyri, uh, which is in like north central Iceland and kind of like the second biggest town in Iceland. And so we uh, kind of s- stopped in there and, and had a workout there and then just had really good conversations. And like you sort of get direction from like, hey, go check this place out. Go check that place out. Like stuff that doesn't come in the Lonely Planet book or like it doesn't kind of come in the research of uh, through the Internet even. So yeah. I like I like how that works out sometimes. It's funny you mentioned CrossFit because I was watching the Strongest Person documentary on Netflix and like half of the women and a few of the men are from Iceland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a huge presence uh, of, of CrossFit there, I guess, which I hadn't realized, but it seems like that would be a big thing culturally there at least. Yeah, it definitely was. There was some of the, the uh, fittest uh, men and women on earth, according to CrossFit, are, are from Iceland. There's a big uh, following uh, at CrossFit Reykjavik uh, that some of the best in the world train out of. So I guess there's just something in that blood that, uh, you know, that helps them be stronger, more fit. <laughs> I <laughs> <Yes>. don't know. <laughs> more driven to be. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Before we uh, go on to CrossFit, because I'm curious about that, um, was the camper van a good idea? I loved it. I think it was it was a, a totally unique experience that... Uh, I think if that's what you're looking for, go for it. Okay. So it was, it was definitely would do again in, in terms of the way of traveling. Yeah. It's a kind of a slower travel method. You're not hopping around so fast. Maybe you're just kind of making your way through. Leisure. Leisure. Of leisure. Yes. Which is nice. So you mentioned CrossFit and yeah. you did CrossFit in Iceland. How did you get into CrossFit and, and when? Living in New York, uh, that's kind of when I started to to pick it up. Uh, there was one CrossFit box in all of New York City at the time when I started uh, like getting into or recognizing CrossFit. So if I had known then what I know now, <laughs> things could be a different, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my journey and, and what's happened. But uh, the, the, real, uh, the real journey of CrossFit began, I suppose, when um, I moved here to uh, from New York to St. Paul, and I, um, I was it, it was a pretty dark time for me. Uh, I was uh, I came back from New York to uh, enter a, a, a inpatient treatment for uh, alcohol abuse and drug addiction, and the only thing that made any sense to me was. Uh, how I moved my body and what I fed my body because there was a lot of there was so much talk about uh, a higher power and and all of that sort of just I wasn't wasn't mentally or, or or emotionally ready to to embrace such a thing so the only thing that made sense was this physical connection to the body moving my body eating well trying to like you know just get get my physical body in, in a place where I could potentially be more present for the mental and sp- uh, emotional and then eventual spiritual self. So I have a saying, which is, uh, so in discovering my body, I was able to discover my soul. That's kind of my journey. And that's how uh, I came into CrossFit is that that's my journey mm-hmm. is that it's a physical connection to the body but it ends up being a very spiritual and emotional uh, connection and journey uh, along with it. Was there a moment when that came to you specifically, do you remember? Or was it more of like an evolution of exploring this stuff? I think how it works for me is like there's like little whispers uh, that happen. 
uh, it isn't necessarily like a, a big jab in the face or a white light moment. Uh, for me, how it's worked is that it has been an evolution. It's been about um, uh, learning and education. And it's kind of uh, sort of learning to live in the practice itself is kind of in the practice in this case being, uh, you know, going to a regular CrossFit class, uh, going to, uh, uh, you know, AA meetings. So like in that, in those practices, uh, I sort of started to find like that was what really connected me. So there's, uh, there's a really fascinating definition of, of a warrior that I uh, really relate to. And it's a, a definition by this famous anthropologist named Angelis Arian. She's no longer with us, but she has this uh, fourfold way archetype. And one of the archetypes is a warrior. And she defines uh, a warrior as someone who shows up and chooses to be fully present physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So that's kind of like, I, I, that is not like something that I have found uh, that is natural to me. I'm, my natural inclination is to run away or <laughs> avoid. <laughs> so that is, uh, that's, like the, the biggest shift is that I uh, had to actually show up and confront like everything that was going on in my life. And I had completely lost connection to my physical body. And so through connecting to my physical body, like it just started, little things started to just align a lot easier. I could sit in, in a, a meditation and be far more present when I'm, I was taking care of my physical body than if I wasn't taking care of my physical body. What were some of the, the small things that helped you get there? Like some of the maybe rituals or the practices that evolved into your current? Well, I think the biggest is uh, getting involved with a, a meditation meeting that I found early on that was centered around... Uh, developing one's uh, spiritual connection to something greater than themselves. It's still something I practice, but that immersion or that practice of going to a 10 minute meditation in a group uh, and then having someone share about their experience with uh, a, a connection to their higher power and uh, then kind of breaking up and talking about it is really, uh, I think, how I like to see it or visualize it is like that was me kind of getting right before you like jump into the wave of like an ocean. If you're at like the ocean, it was me kind of putting my up to my ankle knee level type of experience. Like I probably at first had some hesitation that I didn't want to go dive into that wave or that ocean. I was sort of still cautious but at some point, like, I think like the thing that I've actually been reflecting on a lot lately, and this kind of relates is that I needed to take, I needed courage and how I found courage was by taking action. And the most, uh, like the hardest thing for me at that time was uh, asking for help and like trusting that there would be help there for me or love and support. And so the, the whole point about courage is that you got to take action and you got to reach out or I had to reach out and ask for help and support. And the most amazing thing is, is that like in my fear, by taking the action of, of countering that fear, by taking the action of being willing to admit that I needed some help and that I needed some support, I don't think there was one individual that said, no, I won't help you. And I think for me, like that's where the current, like that is what has inspired me to do the work that I'm doing now with uh, Wild Joy. 
which is about helping masterful and daring men to rewrite their own male narrative. It really starts with uh, surrender and being willing to ask for help. And that's not something that comes real easy. And so I know because I've been there. (laughs) You got into it a little bit, but how would you personally define courage? Like, what does that look like to you? And you mentioned asking for help. I feel like courage is not necessarily uh, is so easily put into words intellectually. Courage, in my experience, is found through uh, taking action. And only through taking action do I start to see results of, okay, like I can do this. Uh, I think for me, the biggest inhibition or the biggest limitation has been like uh, not believing in myself, sort of under believing in myself. And so the, the antidote to that is I have to, in some ways, like ride out to meet it and take a different kind of like understand that about myself so there's some self-reflection and know that like hey this is uh this is the fear response happening and so there's a little bit of uh you know there's that self-awareness and then there's the that self-awareness can lead me to how to decide to behave or act differently one of the things I've, I've really been uh, good at in my life is shutting the door on possibility. So even when it, the possibility or the opportunity or the relationship didn't necessarily mean that the door needed to be closed, I would just go ahead and shut that door because I didn't really believe, uh, I didn't think I had it, what it takes to kind of keep that door open. So where I'm trying to go here is how how important it is for me to live from a place of love, hope, and possibility. So maybe that's what courage is, is to, for me, is to live my life from a place of love, hope, and possibility. Wow, that's powerful. That's a powerful thing. And I've never... really thought about courage, but as you're defining it, I'm recognizing some things, uh, in myself as well that, that feel like there are doors that I may have closed or doors that I may have not walked through because I haven't felt like I should be able to, or for some other reason. And so that's ringing, uh, (laughs) ringing in my ears right now in a lot of ways. So I appreciate you sharing your, your perspective around that. That's sure. That's huge. I know a lot of people have heard about meditation. A lot of people maybe have tried meditation, but to struggle with it. Mm -hmm. Might you offer some advice to someone who's just starting out wanting to get it? You know, like, when is it supposed to do the thing? (laughs) (laughs) When's it supposed to reveal the secret, right? Yeah. So how I see it is... We think about meditation as uh, stillness. That's maybe an image we get. We have a, a, a mental model of, of Buddha sitting in silence or you know, reflective meditation. I'm not saying that you know, everyone has their, has their path, their journey into what that is. I think it's really about unconditional presence and awareness. So even in driving your vehicle, you can have a moment of meditation, just unconditional awareness and presence in that very moment. Um, Even we talked some about CrossFit, like, can I stay present in the midst of my workout? Um, I like to cook, I'm a chef. So even that is a meditative practice. you know, the famous uh, karate kid, wax on, wax off. Even that can be a meditation. 
if I were to offer any suggestion for people who are struggling with just the physical place of being still is to really think about just uh, finding uh, unconditional presence and awareness in an activity that they love to do or don't love to do. Washing dishes is another great reflection. You know, so it, it doesn't have to be what we think it has to be. I think that that's where we, I have gotten even mixed up with. So if ideally, like if I'm in my best of days, like my entire day, everything I do is a meditation. Right here, having a conversation with someone should be a meditation. Like, can I be fully present and aware? I love that you said dishes, because for me, dishes now, at this point in my life, it took maybe 33 years or so, but di things like dishes, things like the lawn, mowing the lawn, or simply taking care of our yard, uh, weeding, things mm -hmm. like that. Things that I used to view as like awful. <laughs> let's, just put <laughs> yeah. it, let's just put it that way. Yeah. I used to really dislike doing those things. And what has started happening over the last several years is this pride I feel in taking care of how our home looks, um, having a, a nice small, but nice yard for us to sit in. And while I'm mowing the lawn, uh, we're trying to reduce the lawn by adding garden and things like that. But as I mow the lawn, I'm not listening to anything most of the time. And I often end up having some of the ideas that become videos and they become scribbles in my notebook later while I'm just sort of just going along, just following that process. And it's the physical nature of, of doing something like that. I have found to be incredibly helpful. So mm -hmm. it's, it's um, a different form of sort of meditation in work maybe or meditation in practice I don't, I don't yeah, know yeah i really love what you said and i i can totally relate to that like i can re i re i know that like in mowing the lawn like i have like this revelatory thought i'm like oh my god that that's what it's gonna be you know like so there there is like in doing simple but productive tasks like i, I there's just something i think we're we're innately connected to doing as humans putting, you know, doing, having a, a purpose to it. Um, but even like how it benefits our like paid work, our, our vocation. Uh, there's a really amazing book about creativity. And in that book, uh, it really, it studies uh, how important it is to have a practice that doesn't necessarily relate to anything they do that they need to be paid to do for their creative work. And that's from banking, artists, musicians, uh, scientists. They all have, the most creative people have some practice on to the other side of things that helps fuel them in their vocation and the thing they get paid for most. Hmm. Do you know what book, that, what book that is? It's called Creativity. It's just called Creativity. And if I could say the guy's name, uh, I would. It's It's... Uh, is it Mihaly? Yeah. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, know, well, you did it. The, the, <laughs> he is the, I mean, the reason I uh, know his name and have practiced because I've had to say his name in videos before. Oh. And so I've, Cheek sent me high. Literally, I had to watch a tutorial on how to properly <laughs> say this guy's <laughs> name. But uh, he also wrote a book called Flow. Yep. I'm familiar with. Yes. Uh, that concept is one so that's become so important to me that uh, I literally have it tattooed on my arm. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so awesome. And, and I just continually keep finding his work to be true. Um, he talks a lot about positive psychology and, and yep. the ideas of flow and creativity and, and all these things. And one of the keystone things that, that I think applies to Break the Twitch especially is that he suggests that vegetating is not relaxing and that it is in fact meaningful work of your choosing and getting into a flow state where you lose track of time and you just get encapsulated in a challenging but not overbearing 
problem mm -hmm. that is actually what recharges us and keeps us engaged in our relationships and life and all these different things. And that is so opposite of what feels easy now where scrolling feels easy. Uh, social media feels easy because um, it's quick little dopamine hits. You mm -hmm. get to check out things. You never know what's going to be there, how many likes you're going to get, all these different things. And and so this concept to me is, is one I'm continually exploring. And I haven't spoken a lot about this yet because I still feel like I'm exploring what it means and how it all can be applied directly. And once I feel more confident in that, I'll probably be talking more about yeah, that. Yeah. But, but uh, it's brilliant stuff. You know, one of the true... Uh, kind of the very true hard realities that I've come to learn to live by is there is no easier, softer way. Um, you, I, you have, I have to, maybe for some others, that's fine, but I have to go to work. I always have to go to work, uh, whether it's, uh, changing a, a, a behavior in, in, in my relationship with my partner, Julia, um, if it's a relationship, I need to, usually it's about relationships. Obviously. So uh, in my family or in uh, business relations, um, I have a role and I need to always work on how I can be the best partner, the best uh, son. But that's, uh, you know, that, that there is no easier, softer way, like, it's just kind of the, I feel sorry for myself sometimes. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, I better just get back to work. <laughs> I keep wondering if there's going to be a point when things get easier. And in certain ways, things get easier. Maybe we become more familiar with them. We get better at them through practice. So it's easier. But then I just sort of find myself taking on increasingly difficult challenges, feeling like that needs to be my work now. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm going to get there too. So that resonates. What you're saying resonates with me. Um, what does that work look like? Like around the relationships when you're saying go to work, like how does that show up? That work for me looks a lot like where fear is coming from. Well, first it, it, it's about trying to recognize, well, what... <laughs> what that fear is. And it usually looks like, uh, what am I afraid of losing or what am I afraid of not getting? Um, so recognizing that, uh, then it's about trying to recognize, um, you know, how, uh, get some perspective on how I need to show up differently because of that. You know, if I'm not showing up in my, like, let's say my uh, relationship, if I'm not showing up, uh, emotionally, um, I might need to sort of start focusing on how I need to first be uh, show up physically. So I need to take care of my physical body. Am I moving? Am I not moving? Or am I eating right? Am I not eating right? So taking care of like, it's kind of like going backwards from that warrior list. Like, so there's the spirituality, emotional, uh, mental, and physical. So it, usually when the physical goes, the rest of them go. So I have to, the first practice for me would be then to start getting back into the physical side and then the mental, emotional, spiritual will start to, to flourish. Mm -hmm. But it, like I said, the, the, the work comes in, uh, you know, fear, self-centeredness, selfishness, and, uh, and it's really just trying to understand, like, uh, shine a big, bright laser light on those shadows that are always kind of coming and going it's it's like the tides of the ocean like there is never going to be i think uh a time when um it's all going to be paradise i never expect that i expect to always have to go to work and and just to continuously be aware that you know they uh, these fears of mine or this selfish behavior this self-centeredness um it's going to keep popping up and I just have to continue to be willing to look at it and admit, you know, probably admit that I was wrong, be a hundred percent radically responsible and be willing to do things differently. That my way is not the right way. 
Sounds a lot like courage to me. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's probably a little bit like in there. Yeah. <laughs> courage to do things a little bit different. Yeah. Sort of like uh, in the, in, in uh, the serenity prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers. It was something that was taught to me by my college tennis coach. And it changed my whole life. But it's uh, the courage to change the things I can. How how has food become a part of that? Because you had mentioned what you how you move your body and what you put in your body. So how did that evolve into food, and what does that look like? Well, I always uh, had a, a, a strong interest in food. Uh, I started kind of cooking, even a little bit in high school, um, but then it kind of continued into college. Is kind of dabbled. My mom always uh, was was really great at always having home cooked meals. And so I was really lucky to have that as a, as a child and, and, and a, as a young adult. And so I think where it really got most important to me was in my uh, getting sober, I, um, I had a book with me it was called the new evolution fitness diet by a guy named arthur devani and don't ask me how that book ended up in my bag that i was taking the treatment on the morning i was <laughs> intervened upon but it did um but it was really um the whole point of the book was like eat if you're eat as if your life depends on it because it because it does and so it was Really, I guess you eat like a caveman. So eat lean meats, uh, fish, uh, vegetables, some fruit, some nuts, seeds, little starch, and try to eliminate the pastas and the breads and the rices and cereals, things like that. And it was really bizarre at uh, being in treatment and people... They, they had no uh, concept of healthy eating. They, 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 uh, the people there, and this might have changed by now, which I'm sure it has, but they just wanted people to eat because they hadn't eaten in a long time. And I just, it, it, I didn't want to go with that way. So I started to just eat uh, what I, kind of the things I just outlined and, and my, my energy started to improve. Uh, my sleep improved. Uh, I just didn't feel like, uh, like even I think, uh, physiologically, like what's going on in my body as you're kind of detoxing from drugs and alcohol is like your body is spiking, your body's in a constant disarray. Like it's panicking because it's not getting the thing that it's so used to having. So by, I believe by controlling what I was eating, it kind of started to eliminate some of those like sh super high spikes of what my body was was craving, especially sugar, because what is alcohol? Sugar. I didn't see a lot of people cooking. Uh, I guess we call it paleo uh, these days, and I just didn't see a lot of people cooking that way. Um, and so I just sort of took it upon myself to self-educate myself, and and found a, a great mentor uh, through my CrossFit gym, uh, a, a a great chef and great man um, here in Minneapolis, a guy by the name of Alex Roberts. Uh, he just had everything I would have never thought a chef would have. A strong family, a uh, loving family, and just having like uh, treating people as kind, precious souls. Um, which you think about, uh, these like Gordon Ramsay, the chef, like the kitchen from hell, like that's the image I had of, of what a chef was. And then here I met someone like Alex who was like, wow, like that's the kind of, that's the kind of person I want to be like, stick with that person that has something I want also in my life. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like that's a big part of what you're doing right yeah it, it, so, it, it, it is a big part it's a i am in the process of creating a um a 
Kitchen Mastery series. Hmm. And so what it will focus on will be primarily uh, essential skills that uh, I feel have become non-existent in the in in the kitchen and in 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 our homes. Uh, I really believe that um, kind of like how my mom uh, cooked for us, I do believe that by cooking our own meals, it elevates our health and well-being beyond just uh, just whatever it is the type of food we're eating. There's a, a, a an artistry and poetry to it that has uh, been missing. And I would like to inspire um, other men, especially, to try to uh, bring that back into the family in a unique, creative way. Something that has uh, heart and meaning in into the the relationship and the family as a, as a, as a whole entity is by providing um, meals. Health, like whether or not it's always healthy or not, is is not necessarily the 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 key, but bringing that element of cooking and actually inviting your kids into the picture of actually cooking is really, I think, another way to help uh, get kids to eat more diverse foods. <laughs> it would make sense that them being a part of the process uh, would make it more exciting, even if it comes to growing, right? Like growing some veggies in the backyard or some dark leafy greens, whatever they may be. Uh, at least I know my sister has done that with her kids oh, okay. and, and like that has contributed as well. Just being a part of the process yeah. is, what, is what I'm hearing. I mean, that's great. And what do, what do we always count on for kids are curious. And so I feel like you bring them into like the curiosity of the kitchen. They're going to want to try something like, oh my gosh, I, I, I actually helped roast this cauliflower. Like I'm kind of interested to try this now. Mm-hmm. Maybe. 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 We hope. <laughs> we hope. You mentioned um, you mentioned Wild Joy, and I'd love to know a little bit more about your work with that and, and some of the things you dig into with, yeah. with that. Yeah, so Wild Joy is a, a daring and masterful community of men who are uh, inspired to rewrite the male narrative in their own lives. And... We start by defining what your purpose on for being in this world is. And we find purpose by focusing on what you want to be remembered for and the things one wants to contribute most. And from that, um, so purpose is a really big thing in terms of us connecting to um, our uh, masculine energy. So I feel like that's the most, uh, that is the first essential step in creating and rewriting our male narrative is to know what our clear defined purpose is. From that, we work on applying uh, mastery, which is um, all about finding key instruction, developing the practices, and doing what you love. Uh, surrender, which is the in in the world of mastery, surrender is the ultimate form of courage, and then uh, creative like creating a vision of how you want to see your life uh, with this purpose in place, and then we create uh, the path that's going to get us there, and then the final piece is uh, playing the edge. So taking those risks that are going to uh, help us along the way that require us to let go of ego, let go of fear, let go of uh, all the things that are possibly holding us back uh, from developing further. My journey in creating Wild Joy is all about how I want to help other men uh, do it better than I was able to do it. Um, and so I don't believe that I necessarily like know more than anyone else. I feel like I am just as much of a learner and curious as, as the people I work with, um, as clients. And, 
um, it is just really important that um, as a as a coach, as someone who is helping uh, people develop into rewriting this new male narrative, is that uh, I provide a, a a place that they can trust um, or an environment they someone that they can trust in opening up. Um, you know, sort of like the one thing that I was most afraid of, I want to be that person that they can open up to so that they don't have that, people don't have that fear. Uh, and then just being able to listen, uh, to understand rather than listen to contribute. So kind of trying to do my very best to, uh, then ask the challenging questions uh, sometimes putting myself and my work and my uh, money on the line by calling something out um, that they don't necessarily want to hear. So it's a, uh, there's so much uh, heart and meaning in this work for me. And I really do believe in the power of purpose. And I do believe in uh, vision. Uh, creating a vision and then uh, you know only through creating this vision are we can we create a plan that helps us uh, actually see it happening like there's uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, fear is to me is like anti-vision um, I have felt that for so long in my life that I have gotten in my way of living a life beyond my imagination and in the last year or so like I have finally started to embrace more and more that like I'm gonna live the life that I didn't think was possible so that's uh but I have to first create what that vision is like what does that look like uh, that's where the important piece of creating that vision starts and then from there, I can start to make the path. And like I said, there's never an easier, softer way to get there. But it's kind of holding on to that vision. And, and it might take uh, 10,000 swings of an axe to uh, chop that tree down. But I'm committed to doing it. And that's where going to work uh, is all about. You know, the the, the idea of simply deserving any success that comes is something that I've really struggled with a lot. Uh, and it took probably a year and a half of working with a coach around a lot of these things to help me realize that like good things don't just randomly happen. I mean, sometimes good things do randomly happen, I think, but wonderful connections, people I'm just blessed to have in my life and the opportunities that come in different ways are not, I'm not, I literally just have always felt like any opportunity, any good that I could do, I probably tripped into it and it was luck and I probably don't actually deserve it, but I'll do my best, you yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, seriously, that's like a deep narrative, especially from my position, my particular story with this is, is struggling in different ways through, you know, academia and like different things and, yeah. and feeling like I was just not good enough. <laughs> and, and so that turned into me finding my strengths unknowingly kind of finding strengths, diving into them. But then when it worked or when things go well. And I, I, again, have these just amazing people that I, in my life that I couldn't do this life without, uh, it's not random. It's not, you know, like I just, I deserve it and it's cool and I'm working for it. And it's, and, and that's a weird, that's a weird balance. Yeah. It's sort of flip, you know, sort of that change in perception or that shift in the soul mm -hmm. that happens uh is really i don't know sometimes it is that white light moment that happens for people sometimes it's in my case it's been more gradual but i i can really relate to that uh journey that your experience that you just shared around 
how that change or that perception and that life just sort of shifts and that uh, I, you know, the not believing in myself or that uh, I can really relate to that too. And that it really, life did change when I started to create a vision for my life that I uh, wanted to live. And I think what, you know, for in my case too, like I, uh, I didn't get sober just to not drink anymore. I got sober so that I could live to my fullest maximum potential. Like having that uh, experience, um, and not everyone does, and a lot of but a lot of people do, uh, and a lot of people it comes in different appearances of the same thing. But to have that experience, in my case, um, I mean, I, I uh, that's what is you know, keeps me, that's my why, uh, that I keep waking up with every day. Yeah. That's, uh, that's powerful not to stop this thing, but to enable this thing. That's a, it's an incredible perspective that can be applied to so much, <laughs> just so many things in, in life. And especially when, when talking about things like the Twitch, right? Break the Twitch, yep. the little, the things we're, we're doing subconsciously, that's a, that's a, wow, I'm going to steal that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, cause it's true, right? We're doing these things not to just stop doing these things. We're, we're doing these things so that we can reach our potential or what looks like the vision we hold. And, and that's, uh, that's a brilliant thing. How do you stay focused on that? Because there are just so many distractions of all types and right. Clutter is, is distraction is whatever you want to call it. What helps you stay focused on these goals, this vision? Um, well, one of the things, one of the practices I do is, uh, so I have, I have my, my, you know, we talked about developing a, a purpose statement. Mm -hmm. So my purpose is or to inspire uh, heart, meaning, and joy in relationships. And so every day I, 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 I wake up and make sure that I'm conscious of it, bring it into my awareness, and then every night I go to bed, I, I reflect on that. Like, how did I, where did I best uh, bring that into my day, and where uh, could I do it better? Mm. Uh, another practice is, is uh, reading uh, and this is something I've actually really gotten into with uh, my in my relationship and with my partner Julia is actually scripting uh, a vision for our relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are so I have my personal and then I have one in my relationship. And so it's something I um, again just sort of kind of like a daily reading like at the breakfast table or I try to get up a little bit earlier to try to take in a moment in my day, no more than probably five, you know, sometimes 10, but no more than five minutes to just reflect on that, let it soak in, bring that kind of awareness in. And then I also, uh, another thing that I do is, uh, it's called, it's like a mind mapping tool. And what that means is that a lot of the vision work starts in text. Um, what helps me and this kind of connects to the creativity piece is to create something like a drawing of a picture or a, uh, I, I know some people have, uh, that have done this, uh, have carved little, uh, woodworking or stones, mm. um, to remind them of what their vision and their, what they're moving towards. I've also found it in music. Um, so I have, uh, I'll take a, a, a sample from a song and I'll kind of do a little work on it and then play that out. Um, so there's other creative ways and acts uh, that I can utilize to help me be in touch with that vision. And it seems to be working pretty well. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. no, it does. It, it, I mean, the more I can be reminded of it, the more it 
connects and starts to like resonate in 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 my soul and in my heart and then from the inwards out it starts to pres- change the way i think and then through the thinking it changes the way i actually interact with people interact in the world yeah that's great and just having that roadmap that kind of something set in stone as you said like <laughs> carving the stone but having that reminder the token of some some type that that makes a ton of sense to me yeah Nick, what are you looking forward to right now? Uh, well, I'm looking forward to go seeing my girlfriend in Boston. <laughs> she lives in Boston right now, uh, going to uh, grad school out there. But what, uh, as it relates to um, you know, uh, you know, meaningful work, um, what I am most looking forward to are uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, this uh, kitchen mastery course that I'm really excited to uh, get to work uh, in a kitchen, professional kitchen again. Uh, it's been a few years since I've, I've been in there. And it is just something I, I love being in the kitchen. It's, it's, uh, so I'm really excited about uh, where this project could, could take me. And then creating a, uh, a sober pickleball league. Oh, <laughs> I'm loving pickleball and what is what is pickleball it's I've like a condensed it, but... version of tennis but you play with uh, there's different paddles and balls but okay. it's less intense than tennis uh, and there's a lot of it's not as fast either but there's a lot of volleying involved and it's a lot of fun mm-hmm. and so I feel like bringing um, a, a league together like a sober league here in Minneapolis would be really fun so I'm kind of getting ready to do that, uh, trying to find a couple places to host it and get people uh, get people involved. That's great. That's <laughs> great. Well, I'd love to have you uh, answer a question oh, from yes. the bowl at this Absolutely. point. What do you think? Yes. We can go for it here. Let's see what we Should got. Should I show it to the audience first? You can then, if you want. You can read it. it read it. Is it, it upright? It is. That they can read it? You nailed it. Okay. Oh boy, this is this is one. Okay, so this is from Patrick. I just saw Patrick Roan, who was a previous guest. Okay, and uh, prepare yourself for something deep. I'm sure. Who am I, and who is I before you are? Where do we start with that? Oh man, Patrick Roan. Wow, deep. So I need to just take a second and process this. Yeah, There's the it's you. the. Uh, So I think how I'm going to start this answer is we are not human beings having a human experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the I before you are in this question really connects to uh, my connection to my purpose. So I am here to be of service to... uh, this purpose, this inner driven mission that was uh, somehow assigned to me in, in the great cosmos of, of, of the universe. When I go, like, I want to be able to leave this earth and the people that I touched a little bit better than when I wasn't here or when before I got here kind of thing. And so I really do feel like this is a, a, a super spiritual question. And that's, uh, you know, like I said, the human experience is, is all what we spent uh, a lot of time talking about today is, is how ego, selfishness, self-centeredness, and fear can all be roadblocks to me living out this life of, of purpose and, and I think being of maximum service to, to myself, to and to others. I have no idea if I'm answering your question correctly, Patrick Roan, but uh, that was my best uh, attempt. I would struggle with that question, so uh, it's. I think you did great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, where can people find you online? There are a couple of ways that people can find me. Um, mostly, uh, you can visit my website at 
wildjoy.com. That's Wild Joy. And then if you are interested uh, in learning a little bit more about um, the community of daring and masterful men that I talked about, I also have a podcast called The Men of Mastery, and you can find that uh, in iTunes. And uh, if you're just so happen that you are uh, living in Minneapolis and St. Paul and are uh, interested in either sober curious or living a sober life or, or, or needing support um, in um, sobriety and recovery, I offer a uh, free donation-based class uh, in St. Paul uh, at my uh, the CrossFit gym that I belong to. And it's a donation-based recovery fitness class. And so if you're in any of those areas, uh, if you find yourself in any of those areas of your life, please come. Perfect. Well, Nick, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to, to chat with you today. Yeah, and thank you, here. Anthony. I really feel like um, there's a lot of alignment and synergy between um, how we view and live our lives. So it was a great conversation. Mm-hmm. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right. As usual, I'm looking forward to sharing one of my major takeaways from this conversation with Nick. But first, I just have to ask if you are enjoying this podcast, please take a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It is absolutely essential to getting the word out about podcasts like this one and helps other people know that it might be something that they would enjoy listening to. For those of you that have left reviews, I greatly appreciate it. It means the world to me that you took time to do it. So thank you so much for that. One of the things I really loved about this episode with Nick was our discussion around meditation. Meditation is something that can often be intimidating for people. And one of the things that really stuck out to me here was the idea of meditation not being that kind of thing where we sit quietly and go, um, or just sit silently in a perfect pose, really breaking free of the expectation of what meditation is supposed to look like. I think we all have an opportunity to bring meditation into the mundane, whether it's doing the dishes or mowing the lawn, doing some yard work, or simply folding laundry. We can find a moment to almost have a Zen practice to admire the way that we are folding the clothing, to embrace that moment and not let our minds get carried away with what's happening in the future or the past and simply being present in that moment. Not only is the perspective shift incredibly valuable, looking at something like doing dishes, that if we mentally say, this is gonna be terrible, I hate doing dishes, (laughs) and shifting that to, I'm looking forward to doing, can barely hear myself saying this right now, but it's real. I'm looking forward to doing the dishes today and seeing the satisfaction of cleaning them, of of taking the time to do it well, do it mindfully and be present during the process. All of these things can be meditative. All of these things can be a part of our mindfulness practice. It doesn't have to look like this normal kind of situation that we expect when it comes to sitting and meditating. So perhaps you can find meditation in the mundane today, whether it's dishes or whether it's some chore that you have to do around the house. See if you can tackle that thing and be present along the way. That mind shift can make all the difference. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you next week.